you're in for a real treat tonight because as Barbara uh, being here with us is going to share her vast experience over, I don't know how many years uh, she's going to share with us. And she has eight different topics that she's going to be speaking about. And so I want to say that Barbara is a psychotherapist, a hypnotherapist, a regression therapist, works with crop circles, is the author of several books. And the list really goes on and on. I think Barbara has more lifetime achievements than anyone that I ever know. And I want to give another shout out and a thank you to Barbara, because honestly, if it were not for Barbara, we may not even be having this meeting tonight. Because Ooh. I had, if you'll remember, uh, when I was recovering from a freak illness, and we were talking on the phone, you said, well, you know, this may <laughs> just be the perfect opportunity for you to get started on your book. And I did. Uh -huh. oh. And as oh, an yeah. offshoot of that, then we had the walk-in conference. And as an offshoot of that, we ended up with the Wish Alliance. And so uh, Barbara has kind of been with me every step of the way as we have been developing and expanding. Uh, and she's part of our Wish Alliance as a luminary. And I am so grateful to have her here tonight. And Barbara, without any further ado, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, I just have to say, I'm so delighted to see Jacqueline Smith. <laughs> as well as the rest of you. And she has been very important in my life and my development and my delight. Sheila did give uh, a nice introduction. So a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up on the East Coast and a pretty um, traditional, I would say, traditional way of growing up and going through school and uh, going through all the childhood and teenage experiences. And then I went to a very traditional Ivy League women's college and got this wonderful, wonderful traditional education with excellent people and excellent professors and uh, became a philosophy major because ever since I had been a young child, I kept thinking there's more... There's more to this than what I see. In other words, I didn't know the words for it then, but I was thinking there's more to this physical reality. There, there's got to be. There's something behind this. That's what I kept thinking. Now, if I mentioned that to anybody, they had no idea what I was talking about. So, <laughs> so I grew up, you know, kind of keeping a lot of those thoughts to myself. And what, it, what is really real? And then when I was in college and took my first philosophy course and, and hit Plato, I didn't hit him, but <laughs> came upon his work, um, I, I was thrilled. I, I actually sat in class and cried and sobbed when he was talking, when we learned about is talking about how we all, we people, all live in the shadows of the cave in terms of reality. And that for the rare person, they could look way up and see a little hole of light in the shadow of the cave. And that, that little hole showing light out of the cave, that was what was metaphysically real. Well, somehow that absolutely touched my heart and my soul. That's why I cried out of relief. Like, oh God, finally somebody understands. And not only somebody, but a illustrious person, Plato, whom I respected tremendously. So anyway, that, that was good. That was a little confirmation to me that there is more than what we normally think of as reality. This, that's kind of the theme of this talk that I'm giving, the different segments of my life in which I feel like I had the wonderful blessing of expanding into other aspects 
other energies, other viewpoints, other realities to what we call reality. So anyway, um, I had quite a few years of adult life and children, um, three children in the East Coast. And then because of my husband's work, uh, we moved to California in 1967. And I knew as we were getting ready to move to California, and by the way, we were the only people in our whole families who had ever left the East Coast. And then to go to California, which is considered the wild outer fringe of nowhere from that point of view, from the Boston and Connecticut point of view. Um, but I knew somehow that by going to California, that meant that I was going to develop in ways that I didn't even know, imagine, I couldn't even imagine they existed, but I just knew that this was going to be a big growth area for me. And indeed, it certainly has been, still is, all these years later. So in 1968, I discovered at a weekend workshop, discovered by myself during the lunch break, that there was such a thing as moving to music. In other words, I was left in the big conference room as everybody else went to lunch. And I saw a Victrola there. Remember Victrolas? <laughs> Even before phonographs. <laughs> and, um, and there was a record there. So I put it on the phonograph and it was wonderful music. I don't remember what it was. But here was this big room with a wooden floor and daylight coming in. And I was all by myself, so I was unselfconscious. And I started to move with that music. And I was so inspired by what that did for me to move unselfconsciously to that music that when I came back from that weekend retreat, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to. I've got to do more of that. So I found records and put them on another but Victrola. <laughs> Maybe we were into phonographs by that time. And, um, and started moving to music in my own home. And very, very quickly, I mentioned this to a friend and she said, you're so inspired about this. You, you really ought to be teaching classes. And she found a place for me to teach a class. And I said, well, Okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll do it. And so I started teaching movement classes. This was 1968. And then I began to be aware that there were other, a couple of other movement classes in my town of Claremont, California. And oh, I, I, I was just terrifically drawn. And by the way, I've had this happen a few times that when I was interested in a new subject like this, one day the telephone would ring. It happened truly like this. There was a woman who was calling me, a woman I had never heard of before and never heard of since. But it was kind of like a voice out of the universe or maybe guided by my guides whom I didn't even know about at that time. So this woman was telling me that there was a dance therapist who was going to be coming to my town, Claremont, to the Claremont Colleges and teach a course in dance therapy, which I had never heard of at all. I didn't know there was movement therapy or dance therapy. That had just not come across my awareness. So... When she said that, I felt oh, like in a, a burst of light in me. Oh, where is it? I'm going to go to it. And did. And, and took actually two or three years of classes with that particular dance therapist, a wonderful little troll-like sort of woman from Switzerland, Trudy Shoup. A marvelous, marvelous person. 
And that helped me to legitimize what I was doing. My style of conducting dance therapy was very different than hers. But through her, I learned that there was such a thing as a national um, professional group called the American Dance Therapy Association. Wow, there were other people doing this too. And even as professions, I didn't know that. So of course I looked up the American Dance Therapy Association and joined it and went to their workshops for many years and eventually became one of their workshop teachers. But of course at the beginning, I didn't know all that was going to happen. Uh, so anyway, in my weekly classes that I had in my own town and then eventually to neighboring towns, um, we were exploring so much in movement. It wasn't dance in the sense of teaching dance routines or steps or anything. It was spontaneous movement with music on. The idea in my early days of that were that it would be a wonderful outlet for a person's emotions. It would help people to get in touch with their emotions and embrace the really positive ones that they liked and express and discharge the ones that were problematical, like resentments and angers and jealousies and some of those really negative emotions. So in these classes, which I carried on for at least 12 years, probably more like 14 years, um, the my students who were usually mothers of young children who were at school, we always met during school hours elsewhere. And um, it was very, very therapeutic. Uh, we also had um, a rest period after an hour or so of a vigorous movement. And then I would guide them in a meditation, which I'd make up right on the spot. And during those meditations, I found and my students found that we were really, really expanding in consciousness. It was a spiritual experience, although I wasn't thinking of it as a spiritual experience, but I think it really was certainly was a consciousness expanding experience. And then I would have us get up and spontaneously express on big sheets of paper, big like plain newsprint paper, um, whatever was going on with us uh, inside was very much a personal expression. So I said, don't draw a picture of anything just with the color, with these oil gray pass colors, just express what's going on. If it's a conflict, if it's a feeling of wonder, if it's anger stuff that you still need to get out, express it. And then we would sit in a little group on the floor, like a little informal group therapy and, and discuss what we had been expressing. So that helped people to get much more in touch with their own process. So during those experiences uh, in the dance classes, we um, often, I would see auras. I'd see auras around the head and the shoulders. And sometimes I would even see it around the entire body. And sometimes I would mention that like, oh, Mary, your aura is so green today. So they became very interested in seeing auras for the first time. And I would teach them how to see auras. And whenever they could see them, um, that was really exciting. And we, we all celebrated it uh, when each one gradually learned. And so we began to realize that we are really energy systems, that each one of us individually is so much more large, so much more huge than we had ever thought of ourselves as being. So again, expansion of awareness, expansion of consciousness, really. And yet I didn't have that framework to think in those particular terms. And we did experiences with 
what I call energy exchanges through the movement, sending energy to another person and receiving energy from another person. And that in and out, that sending and receiving was very, very inspirational and, and, and very wonderful. And even after a lot of these transcendent states that we would get into because of the movement and the energy work, it culminated one time um, after I had had a class with these particular people. Usually there'd be about 10 or 12 people in these classes. And after a few weeks of, of working with this one particular group, I put on the music on the phonograph of George Harrison's song, My Sweet Lord. I don't know if any of you know that. Aha. Jacqueline's nodding. Um, and I, I somehow deeply, deeply loved that particular song. And we started moving and swaying. And that particular piece goes on for an unusually long time. Thank goodness, because in our all swaying individually, we gradually came together and we swayed with our bodies touching each other, like we were really all in a very altered state. And we experienced merging as one. It was such a glorious experience that I don't think any of us participating in it will ever forget it. And now I'm taking a big leap from those years in the 1970s to 2015, knowing Jacqueline Smith and the other ET human hybrids, and every one of them said that they learned from their extraterrestrial beings, guides, mentors, that we, that means we in the whole of creation, the whole universe, we are all one. And when the first one of you, Jacqueline, said that, I knew it because I had experienced it with this group of people many years earlier. I mean, how wonderful to get the validation of that. So anyway, those movement classes were really, really important. Uh, I think they were great. I got... I, I still, if I would see some of those people, would get really good feedback from them, I'm sure, because I did for many years. And then because of the little classes, somehow other people who were giving conferences in our town, um, they would invite me to open the conference with movement of the people who came to the conference. Now, these were people in business suits and ladies with high heels and all that stuff, you know. And um, But still, I'd have them take off their high heels. And we'd, I'd get the whole group, like maybe 300 people or whatever was at, at the conference, and, and get them moving and swaying and moving around the room and sending energy to each other and receiving energy so that the whole group felt like one. And, did, and then I did that with uh, weekend workshops that my husband and I led during the, all, all through the 1970s and into the early 80s. And um, with each one of those, I would open the whole weekend retreat with movement of the whole group, which might be 150 people or 200. And again, everybody would say, wow, I just feel so expanded in consciousness. So that was really exciting work. And that by about 1981 or 82, sort of morphed into my Tai Chi work. So I had begun to learn Tai Chi in the um, early or late 1970s. And then by about 1981, 
people were saying, Barbara, you should really be teaching this. You know, you have such a, a feeling for it, such a, an expanded awareness of what this is. And so um, I started teaching classes locally um, and doing workshops too in Tai Chi. And there again, it was such an expanding experience because we were working in movement with the earth energies, bringing up the energy from the earth, bringing it through the very center of us up into the universe, opening to the universe and bringing down the energy of the universe through us. So I had this real strong sense of mixing the heaven and the earth in us, kind of like we were the fulcrum points for energy. And that with all of this, there was everybody who worked with me on this in the classes, they, they, we all figured it was a tremendous expansion of reality and appreciative, appreciativeness of the whole earth universe everything and so that that was incredible and we would get into altered states of being uh during the tai chi when we'd really get into it and be doing it for an hour or so and one time uh, we were doing uh, tai chi in the room sort of the recreation room of a church in Claremont, California, it had great big sliding doors looking out toward the mountains in back of our town. And so we were doing Tai Chi for probably an hour. I think there was music on in the background, again, phonograph music. And I was very, very involved in feeling extremely expanded myself. And the next thing I knew, I was out of that room, out of a body, having an out-of-body experience up around the mountains and the fields between the mountains and this building where we were, and swooping around, feeling like I was dancing in the universe with my astral body. And then I came back close to the building, looked through the big glass doors, and I could see my body still in the room doing the Tai Chi movement, even though I, the awareness I, the real I, uh, was outside of the room and out of my body. So I just went through the glass doors and back into my body, carried right on thinking, wow, that, that was really a glorious, expanding experience. Now, you see, each, each um, step each phase, I guess you'd call it, of my life, the dance therapy, the movement therapy, and then the Tai Chi movement work, um, each, each one sort of morphed as I was growing and developing. So the Tai Chi phase morphed into uh, my taking training in past life regression therapy, which I did for five years. And that was all stimulated by having had five or actually seven very, very vivid, spontaneous past life recalls when I was visiting Egypt two times and then visiting Peru one time. And I began to think, wow, these are so vivid, these recollections, these memories that would come up in certain places where I apparently had been, I thought, in previous lifetimes, although up to that point I hadn't thought there was any credence to reincarnation. But here were these experiences coming up spontaneously, which I really had to pay attention to. Anyway, I found out that there was such a thing as the Association for Past Life Research and Therapies and went for five years of training did a lot of past life regression work. And that is just very expanding of who we are. Very, very confirming that we are 
ongoing, continuing souls. That's what we basically are. And that we do come into a lot of different lifetimes one by one and have experiences here. So many of the regressions that I was doing and had done on me by my colleagues under supervision uh, took us to uh, other parts of the world, to being having been other races, other genders, other cultures, certainly. And all of us who were being trained in this work were finding out that we had been many, many different places in the world. So, so it's interesting that when we think of our family lineage now, um, and, and we think like, suppose your name is Johnson, and, and many people would follow the Johnson genealogy back as far as they could in history. Uh, many of us do that, and one of my uncles did that for the family that I was born to. But when you think about reincarnation, and you think that one lifetime you might have been a very black-skinned man in Africa, like I was, another one, you might have been a North Woodsman in Northern Canada, male, as I was, another one, uh, a young, fair-skinned woman in England, um, another one, a uh, more uh, yellowy-skinned person in China and India and all these different parts of the world in Peru, dark-skinned, black-haired person um, in Peru. So how, I was thinking about this this morning, how does that fit into the genealogy that that many, many people trace from their family that they're born into in this life. So I think that's kind of a very interesting thing. There's sort of a divergence there that we probably have been incarnated into many different kinds of family lines, cultural lines, and so forth. Uh, but anyway, but some people really focus on the one that they're in now, and that's okay. So anyway, in the uh, regression work, it, it turned out sometimes before I even knew about it, and this was in the 1980s, that three different clients in their regressions to a past life realized that they were a different kind of being, what we would call an extraterrestrial being, and the regressions were either of that being living on quite a different kind of planet or having come to this planet from their different kind of planet. And so that was extremely um, interesting that some of us had, to me, uh, that some of us had had experience being these other kinds of beings. And sometimes people were finding that they came from other realms, other dimensions, like uh, usually a, a more spiritual realm, non-physical, that they had come from that into some sort of experience in what we consider a past life, um, but they come into some sort of experience here on the earth. And yet when they did that, the other people living on Earth were not aware of them because they were non-corporeal, but they were very alive beings, very conscious beings. So anyway, um, that work certainly was very enlarging and expansing for those of us involved in it, those of us who have been very blessed, I think, think to uh, conduct this. So I've been conducting regression work since 1984. It's a lot of people. And, um, and the people who get regressed, of course, have had a tremendous expansion of who they really are when they visit themselves, the same soul, in a totally different lifetime, and particularly 
if it's a different gender or culture, et cetera. So that, that has been really interesting work. And then, of course, that um, morphed into uh, people coming to me who wanted to have regressions to extraterrestrial experiences. And um, so that has led into a tremendous expansion of my work from my point of view and ex tremendous expansion for anybody who has regressed to experiences with extraterrestrial beings that they have had. And there's been so, so very much learning. And I happen to be the kind of person that when I am learning something new that is really, really interesting and exciting to me, I just love to share it with somebody. So sometimes I've had opportunities to share with maybe one or two persons. But to my great surprise, uh, because I have been interested in these things and working with them, there have been various conference groups that even back in about 1991 or 1992 started asking me to come and give talks about the extraterrestrials that I was learning more and more about from my clients. Also, um, since then, there have been many, many groups and conferences that have asked me to uh, share different aspects of the extraterrestrial phenomenon. And I, I love that. I, I think that is, is just a, such a fascinating thing to share. It certainly has been fascinating for me to experience. Well, also in the early 1990s, in fact, in 1990 itself, I became aware for the first time of the crop circle phenomenon, particularly as it was happening in England, although it is a worldwide phenomenon. So what happened is that I went to a whole life expo in Los Angeles, where they have lots of speakers about lots of different subjects. And I noticed in the program guide that instead of the photo of the speaker in a, next to a description of one of the lectures coming up, there was a, a photo of a funny little design. I didn't understand what it was. I thought, what's that? And the title of that lecture was something like Mysterious Patterns in the Fields of Britain. And immediately I had that big burst of light inside myself and said, oh, that means we're being communicated with by those out there. Now, up to that point, I didn't really think they were extraterrestrials. But suddenly it was like a moment of truth. <gasps> there are others out there and they're communicating with us through these crop circles. So I went to that lecture and halfway through, I found myself slapping my own thigh and saying to myself, OK, that's it. I'm going to England to check that out next summer, which I did. That was 1991. And I went from 1991 through 19. Uh, 16, and uh, until I moved and just got too busy to to go again. And um, anyway, I went for 27 years and um, to England every summer for crop circles. And every time I would be in a real crop circle, a genuine one, in other words, made by the unknown, the mysterious force, I would feel a whole different feeling that, because there really is a different energy in those crop circles. And that energy we know is there. It can be measured by various means like electrostatic voltmeters and magnetometers and microwave detectors and dowsing rods, which I used, and pendulums which many people use too. And so 
going into a crop circle is a very enlarging, expanding experience. And of course, here you are in a crop circle in the middle of a great big open field with a horizon to horizon of unbroken sky, just experiencing the expansion of space and then the energy of the crop circle. And I think the consciousness that was given in the making of the crop circle by the sorts, which I consider out there in the universe, it really is a moving experience, which many, many people have expressed. And, and I love to express, I loved going into every single one of them. So after a very few years, I started taking groups of people to visit crop circles. I'd meet them at Heathrow Airport in a couple of vans. We drive on the left side of the road and <laughs> through all the country lanes and roads and find the fields where there were new crop circles and go into them. And every one of those people expressed, wow, I just feel so enlarged. I feel so universal because of these experiences. And indeed, I think that that is one of the functions of the crop circles is to enlarge our whole speculation, our whole point of view to thinking that, wow, maybe these are not done by earth people or earth forces. Maybe they really are done by something more cosmic, which is obviously very highly intelligent and highly artistic. So the crop circle work, I think, has been really, really important. Um, the energies, uh, the figuring out the communication of messages from whatever that intelligence is, which I think is extraterrestrial. Um, so it goes on and on, and the phenomenon is still going on too. I'm, I'm very happy to say, and even though England has been the concentration of crop circles and probably the most complex and beautiful crop circles, it is nevertheless a worldwide phenomenon. So you get crop circles in rice paddies in Indonesia and China and some of those countries, Japan, and um, you get them in all kinds of crops, depending on which country they're in and um, which crops that they happen to grow there. So anyway, that is very expanding. Now, I would also like to say, this has nothing to do with my work, but with my personal life, that I have been a lifelong skier, snow skier. And I got to be a skier at about age five or six very clumsily, of course. But I, over the years, developed into a very good skier and um, experienced a tremendous amount of grace and flow through my skiing. And at a, quite a young age, I think in by my teenage years, I would experience when skiing, and especially when really doing it with grace and flow, that I was feeling hugely expanded in consciousness. And very often I would have the thought when really skiing at my best that I was gliding through the universe. It was a very, very enlarging, ex expansive experience for me. And it had, I realized after a long time, it had a commonality with Tai Chi, which I had never expected, but it did, um, in the sense that in skiing, when you're about to go into a turn, and of course, you're going downhill. 
that you increase the weight of your body on the land, on the snow, and then you rise up in the turn and then back to the earth and then rise up in another turn back down to the grounded earth. Oh, I lost the picture on Zoom. I bumped into something by mistake. Well, I'll just keep talking. Hopefully, it's okay. So, yes, um, if you're okay, if okay. you will, um, you can minimize your current screen and you're probably behind that if you want to see yourself. Okay, do I push the little straight line up at the top? Correct. It's typically yellow. Ah, there we go. Yay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Suddenly there was the big Zoom name and I was gone. Okay, um, so this the skiing itself was a huge expansion of perspective and experience. Like I would be gliding through the universe and then it would morph into I am the universe. And I don't mean that in a megalomaniac way, but it's just that if we expand our consciousness enough, what we can be aware of is being the totality, being the universe. And I will add, all we are all dimensions too. Although right now, we are in the physical form. The big us is in the physical form, living as human beings. And we are so much more than that. So much more than that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that I have done, uh, regressions with people who have had extraterrestrial encounters, because that has been tremendously informative and expanding for me and for the people who have participated in that with me. So a person very typically who has these ET experiences, a person may remember a very few moments of the beginning of an encounter with an extraterrestrial. And very typically they'll be in bed at night and they'll just remember that suddenly they're aware of extra light coming in the room or sparkles of light or orbs of light flying around or they'll wake up to see that um, there already are beings there who are not human beings by any means. They are really different than we are. And the person might be aware of suddenly not being able to move or not being able to call out. And they might be aware of being floated up out of their bed and across the room and through the wall with these beings and up through a beam of light and then into something else, which turns out to be a spacecraft. But usually they're not aware of all of that sequence, just the first few moments of it. But in the regression, it is such a wonderful thing, in my opinion, that people can be regressed to the little tiny bit they remember about that experience and may have wondered about for a long time and may want to know more about, like what else happened besides what I remember. Um, it's such a wonderful thing that the subconscious part of the mind records everything that we experience. Even it records the things that happened to us that we have not been consciously aware of. So that's why we can do the regressions in the state of hypnosis, in other words, deep relaxation, uh, we invite the subconscious part of the mind to give us the details of that particular experience. And it does. The person has the sense in regressing of reliving that experience from the first moments right through the whole experience until they are returned again. So in this work, 
I've done well over 4,000 regressions to people's extraterrestrial experiences. So every one of those experiences has been enlarging of my awareness, my consciousness, and certainly enlarging of the person's awareness and consciousness. And then because I've been invited to share at many, many different conferences and interviews and so forth, uh, that means that many more people have been able to get that wonderful expansion of perspective by hearing about other people's extraterrestrial experiences. And then I've had, turns out as an adult, um, I have had four encounters myself, which I never expected to have. I kept thinking, well, I'm not an experiencer, but at least fortunately I can help others who are. So I think that seems to be very helpful work and definitely expanding of our understanding of reality and more and more is coming to us, uh, not only the regression work, but um, the whole question about disclosure of the mysterious object in the sky, you know, that our government has been involved in lately. Um, that is definitely um, an opening anyway, an opening of expanding for many, many other people in the earth. So I think that that is really wonderful. So in this work, it has been very apparent that there are many, many different species. Some people claim, like Craig Campobasso, his ET almanac species, uh, he claims that there are 89 different extraterrestrial species that interact with people on Earth. And uh, there's another woman, I don't personally know her, um, Elena Danan, and she says, I think uh, her figure for the um, number of extraterrestrials who visit Earth um, numbers in the early 19, I mean, early 90s, like 92 or 93 different extraterrestrial species. And as time goes on, we learn more and more about this. So uh, I think that that is a wonderful expanding of our consciousness. And particularly when some of the extraterrestrial beings are very, very benevolent. They're very, very caring about Earth. They're very caring about humanity. They want to be a help to humanity. There is a universal principle uh, that they cannot come and fix everything for us. They cannot come and undo all the negative things that we have going, but they can certainly inspire us to do that. And that's what a lot of them are trying to do, to help us, to give us suggestions, give us inspiration, give us impetus for saving this species that we are, and which the many of the other species really respect. And by all means, save our precious planet Earth. One of the extraterrestrial beings used to channel through a client I worked with for about 11 years, many, many sessions of regressions we had, and many channeling sessions she did right there in my office. And he pointed out one time that Earth is considered very special, very precious by many of the other civilizations on other planets. And one of the reasons for that is that we on Earth have more species of life and subspecies and subspecies to uh, then all of the other planets that have life combined. So I want to say that again. On Earth, we have more species than all of the other planets have life combined. 
a lot of the planets don't have life. Uh, a lot of them do have life, but but they add all of those up together. They don't have as many species of life as we have. So that is a real intrigue for them. And also we humans are of great interest. For instance, many of them, I don't know how many, but many of them have added to our way of being in the sense that they have added to our DNA. They may have, as some people think, created us human beings way back, you know, millennia and millennia ago from earlier life forms. There is certainly, there are theories of that sort, such as put forth by Zechariah Sitchin and others. Um, anyway, there are many different points of view, uh, even in the Bible, of how uh, we were seeded, influenced, maybe combined with other forms to eventually form the human being species that, that we are. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of these beings are also very interested in human beings, because it's kind of like, in a way, we're their offspring. So that's, that's a very interesting consideration that many people have not had. So in the extraterrestrial work, um, it also came to my attention, in many, many cases, uh, that there is a hybridization program going on. In other words, quite a number of the different extraterrestrial species have a program in which they are uh, creating hybrid beings. That is part their species and part us, human species. And so they do this in uh, what people experience as abductions, and they take sperm from human women, I mean, <laughs> eggs from human women and sperm from human men, and, uh, and then combine that on their spaceships with their DNA and sometimes their reproductive material and create a hybrid embryo. And then they implant that back in the human woman in another experience she just states that embryo for oh usually one and a half to two and a half months and then they take the woman again and take that little embryo out put it in a special tank on the spaceship gestate it for the rest of the months of normal gestation and then take that baby that fetus um, when developed enough out of the tank and raise it as a hybrid baby. And those hybrid babies, uh, many of them at the beginning of this program, they did not survive, but they perfected their ways of doing this and the conditions necessary. And a lot of them are have been surviving for quite uh, a while, several decades now. And uh, so there are a lot of hybrids now, the ones that are one generation away from the human and the extraterrestrial, um, half and half, in other words, those beings are not human enough because they're half ET. They're not human enough to come and live here on the earth. So they do stay on the ships and assist the other beings. Usually there are a few different types of extraterrestrial species working together. And so the hybrids will work and assist them in various aspects of the work that they do. And many of them might possibly live on another planet, but they not they do not come here and they certainly could not live here uh, because they're not human enough to withstand our viruses and bacteria and our kind of food and drink that we consume and uh, they just would not survive here. But then, um, anyway, I, I certainly had lots and lots of information 
about that program that different people experience. And many human women have discovered, I mean, probably thousands, maybe millions of human females have discovered sooner or later that they do have hybrid children. And those hybrid children, generally speaking, live with the ETs on the spaceship, but they do get to visit them from time to time. They've even been, uh, gotten to visit with them very shortly after they're quote unquote born, in other words, taken out of the gestation tank on the ship. And when women have been taken for that purpose, uh, they are asked to hold that baby, newborn, out of the tank, wrapped in swaddling clothes like we do, and to hold that baby, even though the baby doesn't look fully human and might look quite different and quite strange to us. Uh, but anyway, they're hold to nourish the baby because since that baby is partly human, they have learned that that baby needs to have the human mother nurturing. And many of the ETs make a point of bringing the human father to meet those babies and children as they are growing up during the years, as well as taking the human mother to continue to know and, and sort of guide those hybrid children as they grow up. So some women I know have hybrid children who are now fully adult. They're now in their 20s, <coughs> excuse me, or 30s. And um, uh, they still know them. And uh, usually, usually they have become very, very fond of them. And some mothers even wish that they could raise those hybrid children here on Earth. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but they cannot because the children are not human enough. Okay, now uh, going on, there is another whole group of hybrids, ET human hybrids, who do live on Earth. And those are people, hybrids, who were born here on Earth from a human mother and a human father, but either before conception or during life in the womb, these particular hybrids were hybridized by uh, not only one ET, but usually a group of a few different species of extraterrestrials who worked together and created the hybrids. So in other words, sometimes they take the eggs from the woman and the sperm from the man and combine that in with their material, creating a new embryo and then they will plant that embryo in the human mother and let the human mother gestate that embryo developing into a fetus, developing into a baby ready to be born. And those hybrid babies are born here on earth. So they have the <laughs> on earth and yet they have the extraterrestrial genetics. And um, these beings are wonderful beings. Uh, we, uh, Miguel Mendonca and I have written a book about them called Meet the Hybrids. And um, that gives wonderful information about eight different ET human hybrids who are living here with us, wonderful, wonderful people who are here totally to upgrade the consciousness of humanity and help humanity. Uh, so this is a very expanding, wonderful program that they are doing through their teaching, through their individual sessions, through their workshops, through their writings, through their presentations. Um, I think probably mostly through the personal work with individuals and small groups that they do. Um, very nourishing, very high consciousness. And because those extraterrestrials
who created them would really like to help humanity. They'd really like to upgrade or to help humanity evolve. But because they themselves, these extraterrestrials, cannot come down here, live here, and do that themselves, instead of that, they give their DNA to a baby who is going to be uh, one of the hybrids so that that baby can grow up with the ET DNA in them and with the many skills that these beings have. So even when these hybrids are very little kids, they realize that they feel very, very different from everybody else, even from everybody else in their family. They feel like they don't really belong here, that this isn't really, really their home. And instead, their home seems to be way out there. And their real family seems to be way out there. Of course, their human family is not very fond of hearing that. <laughs> And assures them, no, no, you were born here. We're the, your real family. We watched you being born. But they have this sense, and they don't understand it usually as they're growing up, that, you know, this the real family, the ones they long to be with, are out there in space. And, of course, these hybrids living here have plenty of visits from the very beings who gave them their genetics. So again, usually that's a series of a few different types of beings. Uh, so all of those beings who visit these people, these hybrids, uh, they're very welcomed to visit them. They don't consider trips away with them as abductions. They're just, oh, a wonderful chance to be with my, my real family. And of course, they have already been born with a lot of the abilities that most of us don't have, uh, healing abilities, telepathy, very strong series of psychic abilities, uh, a lot of intelligence, a lot of empathy, empathic qualities, um, telepathy, uh, <clears throat> some of them are one wonderful, wonderful animal communicators and locators of lost animals because they can telepathically communicate effectively with them. Um, anyway, they're all healers in various ways, do a lot of physical healing of other human beings and animals. And they're absolutely um, excellent people. We're very, very fortunate to have them helping us to evolve. So they have learned from their extraterrestrial beings um, that the beings would like to see humanity evolve enough to warrant being accepted into the great galactic federation, which is made up of many, many different extraterrestrial species. So far, uh, the world has not been invited, humanity has not been invi invited to join that federation because we're still too involved in murders and wars and killings and abuses and trafficking of humans and all kinds of atrocities. And until we get past that type of behavior as a species, we do not deserve to be part of that Galactic Federation. So many of those groups have been through some of the really negative aspects that we are going through and they have gotten past them. And so over millennia, so they have been allowed to be part of this great federation. And these beings who have created the hybrids and visit them and visit Earth quite a bit, they would really like to see humanity evolve. They would also like to see us ascend and to realize they each said independently, 
they would like to see us know that we are all one. We are all part of the great creative source. So that has been very, very inspiring, wonderful work. And I just thank God that they are here with us. We need them. So now the last category I'd like to mention is about the walk-ins, of which some of you listening to this are. Some of you may not be. But walk-ins, I think, are extremely special people because they came either from an extraterrestrial life out in space, or they may have some of them come from a spiritual realm. But in any event, wherever they came from, they made a soul exchange agreement with a person living here who no longer really wanted to be here. They just had had enough of life. They weren't necessarily suicidal, but they just had had it in terms of life. And so that was recognized by this soul out there in the spiritual realm or the extraterrestrial realm who wanted to come here on earth and have to and would like to skip through babyhood and childhood and teenagehood and be come in as an adult so that they could get much sooner to the work, the very high-minded work that they would like to do here on earth. So what a wonderful thing this is, that the soul of the person who's just had enough doesn't really want to be here in human life on earth anymore is willing to leave that body open to the other one coming in to live in that body carry on the life of that body and eventually work through many many adjustments of that new soul being in this former person's body and taking on the life of that body and all that's in that life, all the people in that life, and get through whatever adjustments that requires and then into doing the high-minded work that they have come to do so that some of the hybrids we know, uh, Watkins, sorry, Watkins and we know who are here now have already gone through that and are already well into doing the magnificent work that they are doing, all of which, as with the hybrids, is to upgrade the humanity in various ways to really help us significantly so that we can evolve and become much larger in perspective than we have been. So these walk-ins are doing all kinds of wonderful work. Some of it, for some of them, is physical healing, mental healing, uh, perspective enlarging, teaching, guiding, nurturing. Um, we're, I think the rest of us humans are very, very fortunate that we have walk-ins here with us and we have hybrids with us. And we really need it, in my opinion, as a whole humanity. So God bless it that it is here. So you see, I think that I have been extremely fortunate. I consider it such a blessing that I have been involved in these particular aspects of work, of knowing these people, and sort of when they have asked me, sort of guide them through processes that help them to know and to understand themselves better, and the huge scope of existence from which they come. 
whether it's past lives or extraterrestrial lives or other realm existence coming into this. You see, I think that we humans, as intelligent as many of us are and as creative as many of us are, but we're relatively quite limited in some ways. We're limited in what we realize as part of humanity. So I think there have always been people who, throughout our human history, there have always been people who've looked further like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and Plato, just to mention a very few, Aristotle. Well, there are a number of people and the great philosophers and the great religious leaders too, who thought beyond the material. They thought into the, the larger reality and have tried to bring that to people. So it's not totally new to us. But I think now is the time, hopefully, that much of humanity is ready for this larger picture. And that's what some of us are, are here trying to bring about. So is there any questions? I would be very happy to welcome some questions. I see a hand up. That Loni. was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Barbara. I always oh, learn so welcome. much from you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And I oh. from you. <laughs> oh. Okay, Loni. Wonderful. I loved it. I am so, so curious about the fact that you said that the ET hybrid Earth have ET genetics. Yes. Is this, is this possibly discovered by I me mean, by geneticists? Can some that be proven or what? That's exciting news, though. Yeah, well, you know, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And we've given a tremendous amount of thought and some effort uh, to that question, too. Uh, of course, we know about genetic testing, and we know about various mm -hmm. labs that will take samples for genetic testing. Uh, so far, I know of a few hybrid people who've attempted to be genetically tested. Uh, in one case, uh, one of the women, not one of the ones in Meet the Hybrids, but another excellent hybrid woman who happens to live in Arizona, um, she tried with four different laboratories um, to be genetically tested. And one of them came back and the only results they said was that her family was Jewish and it was mostly from Northern Europe. That's it. Well, she already knew that she was Jewish and she already knew her family was from Northern Europe. So that was pretty useless. So she tried another lab and, um, and, and then two others beyond that. And, either, and one of the other ones never gave her any results at all. She never found out even after frequent inquiries what about the results of what i sent you you know so it never answered her so that was a total waste and then the other two labs uh said things like well you have some that we don't understand but that's true of everybody everybody has you know what they call junk dna which uh, means that the the, what, the laboratory people don't understand what it is. It has, hasn't been identified. So that's really not useful either. So my thought about it is that unless a laboratory had real extraterrestrial genetics from a real extraterrestrial body, which we know we have on Earth because of the UFO crashes, and the body retrievals. We know we have several of those. 
hidden away, of course, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and probably other places too. But unless a laboratory is willing to admit that they have genetics from extraterrestrial to compare the person's genetics to, they would never, they would never be able to say, yes, you have extraterrestrial genetics. And they're not about to admit so far that they have extraterrestrial genetics to compare to. And then there's another consideration as well which is that um, six of the hybrids from the book Meet the Hybrids all wonderfully uh, joined me for a lecture presentation in 2016 at the International UFO Congress. And we had lunch together, the six of us. That was so thrilling because some of them had never met before. A couple of them already knew each other. And uh, one of them was from England, came all the way from England for this, a woman named Charmaine. Anyway, uh, we got together for lunch and the question about genetic came, came up, of course, and we were about to make a decision on it. And uh, one of the hybrids had found out that any genetic laboratory is mandated by a certain department of the US government to give the results of everyone's genetic tests, any genetic testing that they do, to that department of the government. And this hybrid who found that out, and she checked it with different labs, she knows what she's talking about. Uh, she said, I am not willing to be tested and have the results sent to that department of government because I might be harassed. They might pick me up and try to, you know, it, it, investigate me or open me up for genetics or test me or whatever. And I'm just not willing for that kind of hassle. So that made an impact on the other ones too, who had been very reticent <laughs> about testing. It's not a matter of being afraid of being proved to be wrong. It's, it's just these other factors that are. So another man in um, Colorado had gotten in touch with me after publication of Meet the Hybrids. And he wanted to uh, combine with my leading it um, a program of genetic testing. And since the hybrids I already knew didn't want to be tested, um, but in the meantime, I was learning I was being introduced to other people who very much considered themselves to be hybrids and had good reason to think that. And um, that's where the other woman came in who t tried four labs and, and got nothing out of it, wasted that time and money, you know. So anyway, we had started a program and were uh, getting people agreed to be tested, a few people. And then we gave up on it when we realized the labs just weren't going to come forth with anything of any meaning one way or the other. Yeah. Mm. Yes, that's sad. Really yeah, that's sad. And uh, do you happen to know, my last little bit here, do you happen to know in the genes where that might be, where this genetics physically is? Um, that you know, if we know if we get genes such and such, that might tell us about if we're going to have breast cancer or something. Do we have any idea? Just being a uh, someone being a hybrid, do they have any idea? Anybody anywhere out there have an idea of what gene it might be in the human body? I guess. Oh gosh, that's such a wonderful, important question. Um, I don't know of any hybrid who was told that. Uh, the very few hybrids I know who've tried to be tested, nothing meaningful in the least bit on, in any regard came back. Yeah, so I don't have, a, have an answer beyond that for you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Good questions, Loni. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Loni. All right. Oops.
Okay. Barbara? Yeah. Barbara, you're muted. All right, is that better? Oh, yes, I went to lower a hand and I think I accidentally hit that. Where are we? Okay. Okay. Am I all right now? Yes. Yeah, I so, wasn't touching anything. I thought, how no, did no, that happen? No, it was, on, it was on my end. Yeah. Okay. I'm not the greatest tech person here. So, okay, so Jack and I think Jack Barbara? Yes, hi, Jack. Barbara had his hand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, why don't we go ahead with Jacqueline since she's right there. Sure. And then Cindy. Oh, we won't well, forget I... you, Cindy. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. I, I just so want to thank you for this incredible presentation tonight. Um, thank you. Just wonderful information. And I got to learn more about your earlier life, which is wonderful. <laughs> And, um, and so um, one thing I just really wanted to share with the group in that is I wanted to let you know, I just have read your book. Oh, good, Jacqueline, yay. I, I think it's absolutely wonderful, perfect. Oh. The illustrations are, um, I think, perfect for, you know, um, having, I think they're just perfect. I love the book and I think it's great for children and adults. Thank you so much. And I wanted, it's a lot coming from you. Well, I really, <laughs> I, I love the illustrations and I could really relate to them. Oh, okay. So I wanted to let you know that I went, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> oh, um, good, when good. The, when the um, child is being beamed up, beamed up to the ship and that, um, I'm going, yeah, <laughs> this is really fun, like flying. And, um, but it's just an amazing job by you and Mary. So I want to oh. thank you for doing this book. It's, it's just wonderful. And, oh, and thank you, Jacqueline. So, so well written. And um, again, the illustrations really, for me, I could really identify you oh, know, good. Since I've been on the ships and that, I could really identify with uh -huh. the illustrations and that. So, oh, that's um, great. Well, they, they, they real, the each one of the scenarios there, each one of the pictures, um, actually, uh, the scenarios came right from the work I've directly done with people. Right. So, right. one of the, right. one of the uh, big points of doing the book even though it's directed primarily for children. But our thought is that an adult reading the book to children or picking it up otherwise anyway, uh, could easily be triggered about their own experiences that they had had as children. Exactly. That they, you know, I, I've met so many adults who finally come forward for a regression and um, because they were triggered by something that they saw somewhere or heard um, that reminded them of an experience that they had had as a child that they had long since forgotten about. And suddenly, bang, it's up there in their memory. And then they begin to think more, oh, yeah. Let's see, I was about six years old. You know, now I'm remembering that when I was about 10, something happened. And when I was about 12 and, you know, I mean, it begins to stimulate some memories. And if they can talk about that, well, first of all, if they can get some validation, like you're mentioning, um, right. that is, it would be a wonderful thing for them. And if they can open up and talk to their children or somebody else, because of the book, uh, can talk about their own experiences. That that's a wonderful, liberating thing for people. Well, so we 
it's wonderful and i just wanted to mention it's kids adventures with et friends in space and you can get it at amazon amazon <laughs> so, yeah so um but i just um thank you for um putting out actually i've made very similar drawings of some of my experiences <laughs> of the different beings in that so that was really fun and delightful the to see oh so, great i just wanted to thank you from my heart and Oh, you're welcome. And I want to say, Jacqueline, that um, when Mary and I decided to do this book, I got out big pieces of paper. And for the next two or three weeks, every night when I was thinking of a type of experience that I knew about that I wanted to depict, that I drew um, line drawings of the I, I I love them. I, I'm going to keep them forever. And and then I gave them to Mary. And then she did some computer work and got them colored in. Okay. But I, I just love the ones that I did. <laughs> they're, they're, they are wonderful. I mean, they are really wonderful. So I just wanted to thank you. And thank you for all the information and the talk tonight. So. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you. And Jacqueline, I would like to ask you a favor since you really enjoyed the book so much and you're so qualified to know about it and enjoy. Um, the favor is if you would go to the Amazon book page and scroll way down past the other books they suggest. You know, Amazon always does that. I know. Why don't you buy these too? Uh, so but beyond that, down below that, there's a place where you can submit a review. Yeah, I will do and, that. You know, a sentence or two. Sure. And you can sure. use your name or not as you wish. Oh, um, sure. yeah. But that would be excellent because, and we've got some really, really good reviews on there too. Terrific. Yeah, so that, that helps. Helps yeah. to encourage people to buy the book. Yeah, it does. So. Of course, we would like people to do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so happy to see you. You too. <laughs> okay, Cindy, how about you now? We've kept you waiting. Oh, that's okay. I wanted to hear Jacqueline talk to you anyway, because it was <laughs> Jacqueline's presentation that I discovered your book, Meet the Hybrids. <laughs> And Yay. I can't wait to get through it. Uh, I just and you know, Jacqueline is in that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's the Jacqueline who was in the book. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I do remember seeing her name. But yeah, uh -huh. I, that's it was actually, you know, right after her presentation, I went on Amazon and I got your book immediately. And I Good. was so excited that you were going to uh -huh. do a presentation tonight, which I put uh -huh. on the client site. <laughs> and I am so thankful. This was an awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you oh. for all the information. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, first of all, I was very excited that you got into this through dance, which is something oh. I absolutely love. So that was uh. fascinating to me that that led yeah. to everything else. But- um, Good, good. I was wondering, um, how do you get your client to get so deep that they have the, the regression of these hybrid experiences? And do you feel different, you know, when you're working with them at that level? Do you shift too? Oh, <laughs> great thing to wonder about. Yes. Well, first of all, to get to that level, I, I usually take about, I'd say approximately 15 minutes of giving deep relaxation suggestions. And while I'm giving the relaxation suggestion, I'm mentioning things like the subconscious part of the person's mind has recorded absolutely everything that they've experienced, even the things that happened to them that they were not at the time consciously aware of. But the subconscious part of the mind is recording it anyway and stores it and so when we're looking for it that's part of the what we call the induction 
for yes. the re re relaxation part, that I mention things like that to let the person know that there is a part of them that knows everything they're wondering about because it's all there and and what the subconscious part of the mind records everything that happens and stores it and will yield it when we ask for it when we really want it and so I mentioned that, and I also mentioned as we went deeper and deeper into relaxation that the person's higher knowing, their higher self comes into this, their soul and their spirit guides all gathering to help them to know the details that they want to know and, and to help them with it. And so by the time, and then I count from 10 down to one, that's the last part of the deepening. And um, saying that when we get down to one, there will be there at that time and place that they were wondering about when something peculiar happened that indicated they might've had an extraterrestrial encounter, or in some cases they know they had. And, um, or it might've been a vivid UFO sighting that got pretty close and they might or might not have had missing time. And, but it's, you know, and it, some experience usually that the person has been wondering about for a long time. Sometimes they've wondered for 40 years or 50 years, and then finally find there's a person they can come to for finding out because of regression. So then after counting down from 10 to one, I say, okay, you are there now. It's 1952 and you're in the bedroom of the, in the attic at your grandmother's house or wherever they had said that they were when they thought this, these peculiar things happened. And so I, we start from moment one of their being aware of something different going on and, and then go right through moment by moment by moment so it's a long process because uh, most of the encounter experiences um, happen over a period of an hour or more, sometimes even an hour or two hours. And so the regression, since we're reliving it moment by moment, uh, takes that length of time too. So it's, it's always a fairly long session. It's not like a psychic reading where a person can come in and pay for 15 minutes or half an hour or an hour or whatever. It's, it's different than that. And I, I think it's very valuable because it comes right from the person himself or herself and not from somebody else telling them what happened, but it's they're reliving it. And then there's no doubt for them that this happened. And of course, sometimes people have asked me people who are not regressed uh, ask me, well, couldn't it just be their imagination? So very often after the regression is finished, I'll say, well, what do you make of that? Do you think that was your imagination? And they say, no, it wasn't because they could feel the full emotion or any physical feelings and, you know, and um, they'll usually, you know, vehemently say, no, that was not my imagination. I know now that really, really happened. Yeah. So it's good. It's good to check that. Out. Do you feel different? Like you did with the crop circles, which I find fascinating that you could feel the energy at these crop oh. circles. Does something like that happen when you get a client regressed to that level? Yes, I do. And I do. I mean, I get into a very deep state too, but because I'm guiding it, and I'm taking notes on every word that the person says, and sometimes the words that I say, um, that keeps me from being too deep. Because if I was too deep, I wouldn't be able to be a very good guide, you know? And so actually there have been tests, brainwave tests on this. I, was, I participated when I was with my past life therapy community of uh, uh, professionals 
we we brought an expert in from Colorado, a, a brain, I think it was called brain mind wow. technician or brain technology or something. Anyway, about brain research. And what we were looking for is what are the effective brainwave states for doing regression? And also, what's the difference between the brainwave state of the person getting regressed and the brainwave state of the person doing the regret, conducting the regression? So I participated as a person being regressed, which I, truthfully, one of the most important regressions of my entire life, which I'll be glad to give a side side note on. But anyway, what we discovered in the testing, so I had these little uh, things attached to my head and so did the man regressing me. And we found out that typically when you're being regressed, you go from beta, which we're in right now, beta alert, awake conscious state into alpha brainwave state as we're going down into relaxation. And then for the regression, we might be in lower alpha. That's perfectly good for regression, whether it's ET or past life or this life regression. And then very often the client will also go into an even deeper state, the theta brainwave state. If they go into delta, which is possible, that's not as good for regression because in regression, it's important for the person being regressed to be able to say words, express what's going on as it's going on. So the person leading the regression can guide them through the process. We need to know what's going yeah. on. So. Uh, alpha, especially a deeper alpha, alpha and theta is perfect. So we were tested um, for that. And what we discovered, not only that part, but we discovered that as the person being regressed became deeper in brainwave state, that pulled down to some extent, quite an extent, pulled down the brainwave state of the person conducting the regression. And yet, as I said a couple minutes ago, the person conducting it needs to not get totally down into that state or they could not function as they, the guide. And they could, wouldn't be able to bring the person out because they'd be too deep themselves. So I've noticed that in conducting. I mean, gosh, I must have done multi-thousands of regressions between the past life regressions and the extraterrestrial, probably 8,000 or so. I mean, who knows? I lost count of the past life long ago. Anyway, um, I, I, I notice once in a while that I'm going too deep and I have to do something like pinch myself or take my pen and jab it against my hand or blink or move my head or something <laughs> to not, you know, to kind of alert myself a little bit so that I'm not so deep that I can't really function as a conductor of the experience. Wouldn't be able to bring the person back out. That's always important. Amazing. Bringing the person back out to regular function and consciousness, especially when somebody drives a car to see me <laughs> and they're going to drive away you know i make sure that they're really fully out and fully alert and we debriefed the session what they found and and very often they find that's a very meaningful part of the process as well yeah. those are very worthy things to wonder about <laughs> appreciate thank the you questions so thank you thank you so much for such an extended answer to my question it's fascinating and um and and such fascinating info in this presentation which i was Thank looking you. forward to because i knew it would be like this i just had that feeling <laughs> and now Good i want your other book too okay <laughs> great yeah thank you so so much
You're welcome, Cindy. <laughs> Very gratifying, of course. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Anybody else? Okay, Ross. And then we have two more questions, one from uh, Gary and then Kevin. I see TR. Yes. Hi. Hi. He has his hand up. Barbara, hi. Hi, Barbara. How are you doing? Fine. I we have we have met a uh, couple of years ago. Or so when you have presented for us to us at Boulder Excel, uh, so it was oh. really. I I think so. I think so. I have introduced you, or I'm I'm not sure. Maybe one of my team members were who did the introduction. But yes, it was it was really uh, awesome awesome presentation, and we really enjoyed you uh, being here in Colorado and. Being here in Boulder, so Wonderful. that was really awesome. So yes, and thank you, Gary, for um, organizing. Uh, that was um, always always a pleasure. Yeah. So Barbara, I, yes, I I've read you. Oh, I can't hear. The sound is gone. Oh. Sure. And I also can see. Uh, I cannot see who's speaking. Yeah. Do you do you see me? No. No. I huh. just see. I see five women. Uh, <laughs> that do you, doesn't do seem you, like you. <laughs> do you do you hear me? I yes. hear you now. Oh, it, so so my question is, uh, it's it's a, it's what I'm trying to understand is yes, there are some uh, very awesome uh, souls. Are coming to this plane of existence do you do you experience or do you see any any maybe world leaders coming coming in those capacities uh as a as a walk-in as a incarnate souls from another places that really can their their path their i guess so uh contract is is to help us in in evolution on, I would say, on the global level, maybe political level? Well, I dearly wish that there were wonderful souls coming in as world leaders. I, I don't, I don't weird. have that in my view. <laughs> I don't recognize that. I think that's always a possibility. I, I don't recognize that we have any such soul being a world leader at this time. Um, but what a wonderful idea you have. And maybe that could still happen. Maybe we who are hearing this question from you can put our minds to inviting such a soul to come in and get to be a world leader and get to be of great influence among humanity that wouldn't that be a wonderful wonderful thing i i wish i could say that i think we have that now um i don't in my limited perspective see that but uh boy i i dearly wish for I, there are many many times i have wished for that already yeah but anyway i mean it maybe we uh, even a small group of us like this uh, can put our consciousness in a similar direction and ask some advanced soul like that to come in and find a way through our political system, uh, which is pretty treacherous, I think, uh, find a way to become a world leader and be a wonderful influence. Yeah, yeah because you know, let's say if it's, if it's water leader, or let's say it's a you know Colorado, let's say governor, governor of Colorado, uh, future and and governor and says yes, he or she says I am a walk in, or or I come from from this and this place, and 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 I want to lead this state into into greater reality of of awareness and greater reality of consciousness, and I would love to see that. I would too. <laughs> yes, you know. That person, politically speaking, would probably take 
an enormous chance would be quite a risk. I think because there's so many other people in politics who would just not go for that, would not trust it. They don't know about it, you know? And, and, and so many of the power people are very dedicated to keeping the, whatever power they have, not to making changes for the better. But, oh, I'm, I'm with you, sir. I, I would love to see that and love to see that be successful. Mm. We need it. We yeah. really need it. Yeah, paradigm has to change. Paradigm must change. And it thinks so it's yes. changing. I completely agree. So you see, those of us listening to this, we, we can try to do what we can do with people we know. I mean, at, at least we can do that. We can start these conversations about this thing and show them that, you know, tell them if they don't know that they're, there is a larger reality and there are superb, well-meaning beings. I mean, even here amongst us humans, there are, but it just seems like these wonderful people don't take the route of going through politics, you know, to become a, a, a big a world leader. Although, I think that there are some politicians who are well-meaning and of a higher consciousness, shall we say, who've made it through the ranks to some political positions. But I think that, you know, and, and here and there, um, you hear about somebody who's standing up for something so good that, you know, and I just cheer them on, but then the rest of the political machine seems to kind of clamp down on that. So, so that's not to say that it could never happen, but boy, it's tough. I mean, anybody coming to really make a change for the better has an incredible challenge to withstand the system that we've got set up, the whole political thing and, and the egos and the need for power and control that certain people have. I mean, it, it's mighty. So, oh boy, I wish, I wish anybody well who can take that on <laughs> and really effectively achieve doing better so let's keep that in our minds our thoughts our hearts that 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 could happen those of us who even thank, think about thank it. you thank you thank you for the answer and encouragement oh, yeah thank you. we could just do our little bit <laughs> is that picture of you the one who just spoke Yes, that's just me. That's just me. I, it look, looks like I'm trying to uh, go alive, you know, uh, start a video. And I don't know, I'm in the bed area where I'm at and just cuts <laughs> me off. I think so the bandwidth. So it's just, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for the picture. That's good. That's a wonderful picture. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ross. Let's see. Thanks. Gary, I think you had a question. Yeah, uh, Barbara, I was just curious, have you ever regressed or how many people have you regressed uh, back into a near-death experience and how successful has that been? Oh, great question, Gary. Um, I've not regressed anybody to a near-death experience. I would love to have the opportunity to do that. But I have regressed people into that interlife, that between life state of being when we're in the spirit realm. I've done some of those, uh, but not specifically to a near death. But boy, um, I'm very, very interested in that and read anything that I come across that has to do with that. 
because that is so fascinating and that relates a lot to what every one of us will be experiencing at some point in time when we when we get there when we're in that state of being after leaving the physical body yeah i love to hear Danian Brinkley speak, and I've read, you know, various other accounts of the near-death experiences. Some people in those um, actually have the out-of-body consciousness, but they don't go actually into a whole different realm. Like they'll stay around the hospital and check out what's on other floors and so forth. But... Um, Oh, I did. Re ah, I re I regressed somebody who is quite well known years ago, Ozzy Osbourne, the musician. So Warner Brothers asked me to go to a certain place out in the country to regress him, regress Ozzy Osbourne because they thought that Ozzy Osbourne had seen an extraterrestrial. I mean, no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. He thought that, the director thought that Ozzy Osbourne had seen a UFO at when he was performing in, I think it was Chicago, years ago. There was a big public hoopla about a UFO came over the stadium or whatever, whatever venue he was outdoors that he was um, doing a concert at, a daytime concert, I think. And the audience saw this big UFO closely overhead. And they assumed that Ozzy Osbourne had seen it. But when we actually got to the place where we were doing the filming, and I, he was lying down, getting ready for the regression. And um, so I said, let's go back to your seeing the UFO at that concert that you gave in Chicago. And he said, oh, I, did, I never saw it because I went to the men's room. <laughs> I was inside when the UFO came and didn't apparently stay terribly long. And so then, you know, here we were, the cameras and the sound equipment, everything ready to go, official Warner Brothers, you know. So then I quickly said, well, okay, if we are not going to do a regression to that because you never did have that experience, uh, is there anything else that you wonder about? I thought, mm -hmm. here we are, we've gone miles and miles out of our way, and we're all set up and ready to go. We ought to regress to something. So I asked if there was anything else in his life that he had wondered about. And he said, yes, it was a near-death experience he had had. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's let's go ahead and do that. So uh, we did that regression. And he had a, I think it was a motorcycle accident he had had. And uh, he had a near-death experience. But he never went into the spirit realm. But he did go to various places on the earth, even quite far away. And uh, like, I think it was Australia. Um, and, and we got a lot of detail of whatever he'd been aware of in that astral state. Um, and then his coming back into his body being revived in the hospital, you know, after being rescued from that. But, um, but then there have been other people that I've regressed to that interlife experience. In other words, we've done a past life regression. And then after the dying, the leaving the body for the last time in that lifetime, some people have wanted to go on, you know, what goes on now in the spirit realm. So we've done some of those before the person came back into another lifetime. So I would imagine that a lot of those experiences are quite similar. In one of them, they came back into this lifetime, the near-death ones, and in the other ones, 
it was the finishing of a lifetime here and then that interim spiritual time before incarnating again. But it's the same realm that we're talking about. You know, sometimes in a near death experience, you uh, experience the life review where you experience reliving your whole life. That could take a lifetime to get through. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's very, very quick. Yeah, it is I mean, when from you're. Our from on the our other side, it's quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from our point of view, um, from what I've heard from many people, um, it's a really quick process. And but but you you go through everything from when you were really little, from your earliest recollections, right up to the moment that you died. I think yeah, that must well, that be happened. fascinating. That, that happened to me when I was held underwater and I already couldn't hold my breath any longer. And, I, and so it happened really? that quick. Yeah. Really? How long do you think you were out, shall we say? Well, not, I don't think it could have been that long because uh, I popped out of the water and I was uh, didn't have to be resuscitated. So ah. it couldn't have been more than a handful of seconds. Well, that's good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you made it back out. <laughs> so you, in that quick okay. experience, you you had the life for you. Yes, you and a lot more that I don't really recall. But <laughs> but yes, the the life review was a big part of it. So and Glenda, Glenda you... said she's had four near death experiences, clinically dead. So she was a lot deeper than I was. She might want to comment. <laughs> Who had that? I did. I, uh, was, you did? Yep. I was the shortest that I was dead clinically called in, that they called it was four minutes. The longest was 15. Wow. Yeah. And yes, you do review your life like that. And you're, so each, in my each time, time, each time, each time, Yep, each. and then each time you review up to that point and then they tell you whether it's your time or not and they kept telling me not my time yet. Still got a lot to, a lot of uh, trouble to cause out here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're doing it. <laughs> oh, I'm having fun. I am having <laughs> fun. Is that when you brought back your gifts? Well, is that when your gifts? Is that when you brought back your gifts? No, I've had my gifts from birth, but I do come back stronger every time. Oh, if that's if that makes sense, yes. Amazing. So each time, each time you had um, the life review, mm -hmm. was it? Did the same things come up? Um, mostly, yes. But you, you actually yeah. review all of your life, like bum, bum, bum. You remember different little details every time. But while you're there, it's like a whole movie. You watch, you know how you watch the same movie a few times and every time you mm -hmm. see it, you see something different. Well, it's the same thing. Or you realize, oh, I don't remember that the other time. Yep, <laughs> the same, same way. But I, you know, and then you meet the, the energy that is on the other side. And a lot of it I recognized being my so-called family in this lifetime that had passed on. And uh, mm. when they talked to me and, and what they said, and basically I'm not ready. And then all of a sudden I would get touched in the forehead and boom, I would hear the, the people around me yelling and screaming that, you know, she's back, she's back. Wow. So. Oh my goodness, that must be so shocking. The first I mean, time, all of it, yes, yes. Including the first, to come back. Yes, I didn't want to come back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so peaceful <laughs> over there. So, uh, yeah, every time. When you, Glenda, when you had the life review, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to imagine, I have not had that experience, I'm trying to imagine what that would be like. Is it as if, like when you review from when you were a little child, 
Mm -hmm. Do you experience uh, actually, it from the point of view of being the little child? I actually experienced from the point of view of being in utero. A big what? In, in, in utero, when my mother was pregnant with me. And oh, I, remember really? seeing, I remember seeing myself in, you know, liquid and looking all around and hearing her <laughs> voice and hearing my father's voice. So, yes, I remember all that. Wow. And then, and then when you were a baby and then like a toddler and so forth? Ah, uh, yes. Did it go yes. in chronological order? <laughs> yes, it does. Huh. It's very interesting, very interesting. Oh, yeah. And truthfully, I usually don't talk about it, but I always, you know, it's nice to see that other people actually experience that. Yeah. Lots of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have. And I think it, it's more and more easy for people to talk about it because, you know, the more people who come out with it, the more right sort of normal it, <laughs> right. it sounds yeah well yes. I, you know i i just have so much respect for those of you who've had those experiences wow i mean how amazing it is it yeah is. and and you know it's um you really want to say exactly how it is on the other side but you don't want to give too much because you don't want to encourage people to go too fast with their own by their own doing so to speak so you mean to want to get there sooner right some people yeah, might. yeah. and, yeah. and, yeah. and it's, if it's not your time it's not your time so no you still need to do work here and you still need to learn lessons well so. well i appreciate your sharing about this oh, yeah i appreciate this this is beautiful <laughs> today it's wonderful thank you Thank you. I had a, a really amazing, amazing to me experience years ago, 1983. My mother died very quickly in a car accident across the country. She was in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I was in California. So I went back and, you know, did the service and cremation and all that. And then when I came back out here again to California, I realized that well, I had realized all the time that I wished I had said, wish I'd had a, a meeting with her before she died, because mm -hmm. I didn't know she was going to die that quickly in a car accident. Right. Uh, but there was no closure. And there were so many things I wanted to say. So I went out to a meditation room in the California desert and sat there on the floor, leaning against the wall, closed my eyes pictured her in every way I could picture her in my mind I called her name mm -hmm. all of the normal name her nickname mom mommy when I was a little kid you know mm -hmm. all of that anything she was ever called and um and and kept picturing her as much as I could and then suddenly I had the very strong sense she was there now my eyes were closed but it, she was there I right. could feel her right. presence from the spirit world and so I told her express the things that I w had wanted to and then mm. when that was finished she said oh come with me so I must have at that point I think mm -hmm. left my body I must have mm -hmm. gone in my astral body mm -hmm. because I found myself in her realm mm -hmm. which is not mm -hmm. here the physical realm right and she right. showed me her reuniting with her mother mm -hmm. because her mm -hmm. mother had died when my mother was three years old. Oh. Mm -hmm. She'd had 80 years of her life until she died without a mother ever, mm -hmm. no stepmother mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. knew that I felt very sorry for her because she, she was a very nice mother, and she, but she had grown up without a mother. Right. And I remember one time, mm -hmm. probably I was a teenager, and I had asked her, how do you know how to be such a nice mother when you never had a mother? And she said, oh, 
she said, well, I just, I've always tried to be the kind of mother that I wish that I had had. Wow. And I mean, how <laughs> sweet, that is how funny. generous. <laughs> so she knew that that was an issue for me that I had always been concerned about, that she never had the benefit of a mother. And yet she was a, a good mother herself. Mm -hmm. And so she showed me her reuniting with that mother who had died when she was three years old. And they embraced in the most loving, happy embrace. And I, sitting a few feet away, it seemed right. like, watching this, I just deluged into tears of love and gratitude and mm -hmm. happiness and relief. And that brought me back into my body on the meditation room floor. And I cried for four hours. It's, it's just overwhelming, the love that's up there. Just overwhelming. No, just so much feeling that all I could do was cry. Mm -hmm. and sob yep. Yep. <laughs> so uh, that was a real gift yes and yes. you've had your real gifts mm -hmm. yeah yes I'm very do you blessed. feel like do you feel like you changed some of your behavior or your attitude since you've had those experiences um yes the, the third time I had forgotten how to live, I survived. I was here, but I had not, I wasn't living life. Uh, and, and that brought me back to get real. It's, life is too short. Enjoy what you can here and do whatever you need to do. And, <laughs> and two months after that, I bought a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> a motorcycle? <laughs> Uh, yep. Oh, wow. yep. So you're living the way that you want to live? I wanted to, yes. Well, I sold that. That was a long time ago, but yes, I wanted to. to but you did that for a while. Yeah, I, I did yeah. whatever I wanted to experience. And that, that, was, that was the key. I saw okay. an opportunity and I took it. So. And how about now? Now I'm living my gorgeous life. I um, have a center. I've always wanted to have a spiritual center. I'm oh. doing these things. I'm, I'm in the Wish <laughs> Alliance as an ambassador. I'm, I'm having fun. I'm having oh, fun. good for you. Good yes. for you. Yes. Thank you. That's great. That's, you know, that's a good inspiration for us all. Mm -hmm. Blessed with yeah. every single step I, I take. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love the backdrop behind you, too. Oh, thank you. There it is. <laughs> yeah, look at those lighted chakras. Woo yeah. <laughs> wow, that's great. That's gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment or ask a question? Yes, we have Kevin. Kevin? Okay. Hi, Barbara. That was a fascinating presentation. Hey. I thoroughly Thank enjoyed you. it. It was fascinating. I did have a Wonderful. question for you, but however, you, you answered the question within your presentation. But I thought it would <laughs> ask, I, I would still ask you the question and go through it because it's okay. a question I've had now for many years. And uh, I consider myself a star seed. I've I've had uh -oh. different species from the age of eight. The screen, excuse they, me, the screen froze for a little bit there. Okay. I was saying that yeah. I had a uh, contact with a group of eight ETs, different species from the age of eight. And they've guided me and taught me throughout my life and I'm still in contact with them today. But my question mm -hmm. would have been, how do you differentiate mm -hmm. between a star seed and a hybrid, but you answered that question because you said the hybrids that are here uh, are able to communicate with animals. I'm able to do that with insects, uh, other animals, butterflies, dragonflies, uh, grasshoppers, 
any of those animals I can communicate with. And then I have the telepathic abilities to communicate with the all the eight of ETs that I've been brought up with, as it were. But now I've met other ETs that I can telepathic communication with, have telepathic communication with. And I'm able to travel outside of my body to the higher realms to meet my deceased family members and, mm. uh, and family friends that have died. Uh, so I have all those things that you say. But the other thing is, our ET uh, star families are able to co-create or create using thought and consciousness. And one of the things they do, they will create a craft, a conscious craft. They will separate their conscious energy uh, from their physical. They have physicals as well, like we do. Then enter that craft as pure conscious energy and travel throughout the cosmos, travel throughout the universe. I'm able to do that as well. They taught me how to do that. So now I, I really, I really think that I didn't want to be a hybrid. I was happy being a star seed. But because I have all those abilities that you describe, I'm going to have to upgrade myself now. <laughs> so, uh, but, <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see. But it, I do find it fascinating that um, everything that you said about that just related to me tremendously. So uh, thank you very much mm. for answering that question that I've been pondering <laughs> for many years and I never wanted to be a hybrid. I'm happy being a star seed. But thank you. Thank uh, you. Very much. Uh, <laughs> well, you've had quite an amazing life and group of experiences, far more than most people do. I mean, I think you're very privileged to have that. I think anybody Frankly, anybody who is a hybrid is very, very special and, and very privileged. And, and they get this support from the other beings, you know, which most humans don't have or are certainly not aware of it, if we have it. But, um, but those hybrids have a tremendous amount of support. And, and that, real love, that, 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 that unconditional that, love. And I, I would agree, and I think someone said here, I think it might have been Glenda when she went to the other side, when I've been to the higher realms of consciousness and met with my deceased family and friends going back over 300 years, the amount of love that emanates from them is tremendous. Mm. It's just ah. huge. So, so much yeah. so that really don't want to come back to the physical. Uh, and very often they tried to persuade me to stay there, but I knew that I, I was actually enjoying the physical, so uh, I did come back. And But I know that they're all still there. And uh, I think it's just fascinating that we're all coming together now, that we're all connected on this journey. And uh, I met Sheila through her uh, walking conference. I, I didn't know what walkings were, so I thought I'll have to find out. And I met Sheila, <laughs> and her story is absolutely fascinating. And it just adds yeah. to the whole concept and understanding of consciousness. So I think we're all on a great journey together, and I think exciting times ahead. So thank you again, Barbara, for solving that problem for me. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all that, too. I mean, that's wonderful. What a, what a fascinating existence you've been having. Yeah, and you can you can ask your beings anything you want to ask them, you know. Yes, I, I've done that all my life. In fact, I never thought they were anything special. I just thought they were part of my extended family, well, as with your grandparents or your aunts and uncles. And any time I had a problem, I would just ask them. Uh, I remember when I was 16 or 17, I said to Art D, uh, I know there's much more to this reality. Can you show me more? And they just take me out as your uncle or grandparent would take you out in the car and travel around the uh, the different subdivisions and things, they would take me beyond oh. that and show me many different things. But to me, it was normal. Um, it's just the way I was brought <laughs> up. As it was, so. You know, these are not experiences that everybody has. I'm beginning to understand that now. And I've yeah. never yeah. spoken out. It was only a couple of years ago. They asked me to speak out and write about my experiences with them. So I now do. So, uh, but as oh, I say... Good. Meeting Good. so many fascinating people. Yeah. So are you doing writing then? I've written or a couple of books and uh, 
I've uh, done some radio shows and things. So I do speak out about it now quite openly and I'm quite confident about doing that. So uh, uh, yeah, just, just fascinating. So, yeah. Oh, good. Do, do you like sharing about those extraordinary oh, yes, experiences? Once, once I start talking, Barbara, you can't shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that way too. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I think we, we are very, very blessed, um, any of us who have these unusual experiences. And um, it, it certainly seems to be the time now in history uh, to be sharing much, much more of this. So good for you. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. Yeah, and, and, and enjoying it too. Again, one thing that you said, Barbara, in your talk, sometimes the light comes into your house or light comes into your room. And about three years ago, I'd got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I came back, got into the bed, and then a light appeared outside the bedroom window. It came into the bedroom. It lit up the bedroom like a myriad of butterflies, just pure white light. And then Aunt D materialised at the bottom of the bed and asked me to write and talk about my lifelong interactions with them and that's when I started and uh, it's led me down this journey now and again where I've met these fascinating people so and, and the journey continues and we're all doing that journey together now so I'm I'm really excited for the future and my ET guys tell me that we are moving towards the golden years for humanity uh, so and I'm working towards that yeah. I'm working with others and uh, I say it's just uh, a, an amazing journey. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm glad for those good words of hope, too. Yeah. Good. Well, what a nice emissary you are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I can imagine many people who might be very skeptical about these things, if they, if they listen to you, they think, you know, is it kind of like they'd feel disarmed? I mean, in other words, more open? and more receptive to what you're saying? I haven't found that, uh, any uh, animosity towards what I'm saying. Uh, and even my own uh, friends, um, they're, they're, their minds are opening up to this now. So uh, I'm mm. pleased that uh, I haven't received any negative comments, negative thoughts and things. So uh, it, it's all been positive, which is really supports me and builds my confidence. Not that I need any confidence in relation to speaking out about it, but uh, uh, I, I have a mission here. My mission is to share my uh, lifelong interaction with my ET uh, star mm. guides, all eight of them, and then to help to physical, to help facilitate the physical reveal. That's what they call it, the reveal. And they want ah. that now to come from the citizens of earth. And I'm working was that with others to implement a, a mandated protocol to uh, uh, receive them. We will request we we will request them uh, to come and meet with us once we have mm. this mandated protocol implemented by our citizens of Earth. And I'm working on that as we speak now. So as I say, exciting oh. times ahead. Oh, good for you. That's great. Yeah. And here and there, I meet people on rare occasion, uh, but I meet people who have been uh, charged with, there are three different people now, un unconnected with each other, who have been given the job, shall we say, the task of finding a location here on Earth where some of the beings would be able to come and live undisturbed by the people who would be freaked out by beings from elsewhere coming here. Uh, so it would have to be a, like a rural place, a very private place. And, um, and these uh, people I've met have um, really dedicated themselves to doing that, which is wonderful. So I think sooner or later that will happen. But yeah, the so beings that, yeah. want to have that safe, secluded place uh, to come to before they actually land and try to stay here because they know 
how reactive and how dangerous we can be. Yes, so anything, I... anything you can do to uh, pave the way for that, I think is really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's the case, Barbara, but I'm just one small piece in a very large jigsaw. I'm unimportant without the rest of the pieces. It's all those small pieces when they come together that give us that full picture. And that's the importance yeah. of it, really. Not just one individual or one small piece of jigsaw. It's the whole. And we here right. part of the whole. And there's many other parts as well. And once we get them all connected together, then we will actually co-create using thought and consciousness the reveal that the uh, my ET guides are talking about. So we will create yeah. it through uh, co-creation co-creation yeah. of thought and consciousness and they want us to get to that level of understanding of consciousness where we can co-create when we can communicate and there are many many of us now that can do that so we've reached that level of consciousness where we can openly communicate with them where we can openly co-create with them so uh, again it's just really now going through the next steps the next stages and bringing everyone together under the one umbrella which a lot of people are doing now. Uh, there are many people like Sheila, uh, like Mark Sims, like uh, Mark Gower. Uh, they're all, sorry, Neil Gower. They're all bringing these other people together. And then the people that have been in the industry, so I would say for many years, like Cathy Marden and uh, Ray Hernandez, he's only been in here two years, but all these people have been brought together and we will co-create that new reality, that society that we mm -hmm. design for our children uh, for our future generations uh, and that new society will be co-created with the ETs and that society will include them. So that's where we're heading and we're heading there rapidly. Good. Here, here. That's very good news. And good for you for really being right in there doing this. Well, I think, Barbara, they never asked anything of me and I've been in contact with them now, I'm 67. So that's quite a long time. And they never asked me for anything. So I think this small thing that they're asking me to do, to speak out mm -hmm. and write about it, about my contact, is just a small way of paying back the privileged life that I've had that you mentioned earlier in relation to an understanding of consciousness and the beauty that surrounds us on our planet with all the life that we share on our planet. Very often we don't take time to stop and look and watch and listen. We live in a beautiful world already. We need to slow down and stop and have a look. And then perhaps we'll take care of the planet and uh, take care of one another, uh, which I'm sure we can do with that, so yeah. So exciting times ahead. I'll shut up now, Barbara, because I'll keep going. <laughs> well, it's, it's worth your keeping going. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, uh, anyway, thank you so much for that. That's, that's just wonderful. And uh, I think we should open it up to anybody else who might have a question. But thank you, Kevin, very much. Yes. Where are you located, by the way? Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Florida. Oh, Florida, okay. Yeah. Is that a real scene behind you out the window? No, it's a backdrop. I do a lot of Zooms now, and I have a closet behind me that's untidy. So I thought, I better hide the untidiness and put a backdrop. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was wondering where it's still daytime, like it no, looks it's, like. It's, it's dark now. That's my lamp that's on. So. Yeah, you're dark by now, because I almost am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, Sheila, do you think there's anybody else who wants to ask a question? I don't see anyone's hand raised. There have been lots of wonderful comments, and I can actually send you a copy of all those comments if you would like to look through those, because some sure. people have left uh, messages for you, too. So very great. Okay. Well, yeah, I would like I that because I didn't, I didn't want to take my attention away from Kevin or Glenda or whomever was speaking to read the comments. So... I noticed that they were there, but I didn't read them. So I would like to, yeah. Okay, great. So again, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming. Um, 
your presence you're, is you're just welcome. always a real blessing to everybody and so informative and barbara along with jacqueline will i'm going to share my screen real quick will be in attendance and speaking at the hybrid conference which will be coming up on july 24th and 25th it'll start at 10 a.m pacific time and so if you have not registered please be sure to do so it's going to be a wonderful conference um, two days of lively conversation talking in depth with hybrids about hybrids about their experiences about what goes on uh, behind the scene and so I also want to share with you the remainder of our monthly meetings that we have going on. This Thursday, we have the family reunion coming up, which will be kind of like the open mic. Anyone can share their stories. And I think we have a few people. I think Glenda said she will share a little bit more of her story and uh, we have others. Then on the 22nd, on the celebration of the Mary Magdalene Feast Day, we're going to have uh, Marianne Hernandez, and she actually channels Mary Magdalene. So that'll be very interesting. And then we have mm. Kalina and Rama at the end on um, the 29th. And this is with the Divine Masculine and Divine Feminine. And so it's going to be a very exciting um, action field, uh, very informative month. We also then in um, August, we'll be switching gears a little bit and we're going to be talking a little bit more about contact. We're going to be talking about the sp secret space program and we have um, another uh, lady who is a hybrid that will be speaking with us. And then in September, we'll be discussing angels. And so we'll have a couple guest speakers uh, for that time. I know uh, Joan of Angels said today that she would be happy to come and to speak with us. And um, let's see. Is she still with us? Yes, uh, Zeri, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, is it Zeriel will be speaking also about her experiences and she's a walk-in as well as all of her experiences with the angelic realm. In October, I think we're going to do maybe some paranormal type of presentations. Uh, November, we have channelers and in December, we're going to end up uh, with more of like psychic abilities and our light bodies again. And so um, if you are not signed up and you would like to be part of all of these different meetings, which are free of charge, you can go to info at wishalliance.org and sign, just let me know your information. But the best way is to go to the wishalliance.org website and you can just put all of your information in there. And so I also want to thank Neil with Portal to Ascension. He has been airing us. We have another 56 people who have joined us there tonight and we had 33 with us earlier. So we're getting our message out there and that's what this is all about. Uh, creating community, sharing information and allowing people to speak their truths. And so I wanna thank everyone again for coming tonight and if no one has any further comments is let's see Jacqueline are you still with us let's see Jacqueline Jacqueline Smith are you still with us yes I'm here um I'm here. I was wondering if you would be so kind as to maybe send us off with a beautiful light language blessing oh I would love it thank you Okay, thank so, you. A blessing. Shoki tiatala ki amalia, umaki irakari amaho si ira, ushuku tiana kole ti inamahala, hota zakuriata, thraki imakari anaha, wete i saku umariata lika ina kore. Umashuku u unanatea uita haya use inirikeleki ilakata uya kori tiyomaratea. Thank you. 
beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just beautiful. And Barbara, your presentation was beautiful. Thank you again so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for oh, being you. one of our Wish Alliance luminaries and for everything and all the contributions that you make. Uh, I also thank wanted to you. mention we have Kevin is going to be speaking with us uh, next month. I think you've got the fifth I believe, uh, but I'll be sending all these announcements Good. out. So again, if you'd like to be included, uh, please go to wishalliance.org and sign up. So for tonight, does anyone have any other final comments? Okay, let's let this- I do, beautiful. I do. Yes. I do. I just think you are such a blessing. Thank you oh. very much for coming to earth. Thank you for exchanging oh. with that, that natal, <laughs> that, that woman who left. And I'm sure it's serving her highest good too, to know that you are carrying on in her body and her family yeah, to do your wonderful work. Thank you. Very blessed that you are here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Barbara. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to cry. So before I do, let's all say good night. I'm going to put it on gallery view. Everybody do our final waves. Good night. Lots of love to everyone. Bye. See you Thursday. See you Thursday. Awesome See Christmas. You Thursday. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good night. Really, really enjoyed this. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, Amy. Bye, Cindy. Good night, Sheila. Good night, honey. <laughs> Good night, Sheila. Good night, Barbara. Thank you very much. This is Gary. Good night. Good night, Gary. Good night, Ross. Ah. Willow's eating my hand. So good night, everybody. Good night, Sheila. Sleep tight, darling. <laughs>